uplifts the DJ culture and honors our legends. Vinyl Esquire with DJ Rip. You're now listening to the legendary Vinyl Esquire. Vinyl Esquire. Vinyl Esquire. Hello world, I want to welcome you to Vinyl Esquire, the podcast that delivers culture, truth, music. Would you join me please in welcoming DJ Rip? Hello world, I want to welcome you to Vinyl Esquire and my name is DJ Rip and Vinyl Esquire is the DJ podcast that uplifts the DJ culture and honors our legends. And without further ado, I would like to welcome to Vinyl Esquire. The legendary DJ from the Bronx, the South Bronx. This this, this right here is special because I believe that this gentleman is a part of the true foundation of hip hop. So I would like to welcome to Vinyl Esquire, the legendary Disco B. Hey, 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 hey. How y'all doing out there? DJ Disco B, how are you doing, sir? I'm, I'm doing great, man. I'm doing great. Sitting up in the sun and just relaxing. Wonderful, wonderful. So, so B, man, I want to thank you for allowing me to interview you for Vinyl Esquire. Again, this is the DJ podcast that uplifts the DJ culture and honors our legends. You are definitely a legendary DJ from the beginning. And I just want to thank you for allowing me to interview you. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. I'm glad somebody wants to interview me. You know, well, you know, let let Vinyl Esquire be the one. Cool. So, um, <laughs> so let's take it right back, all the way back to the beginning. Disco B, tell me who or what made you want to be a DJ. You know, just I, I wanted to be a DJ because I heard I grew up a little bit on on one side of town, and I grew up on the other side of town. And one of the things where I grew up at was in sound. And I used to hear the music coming out of Metcalf Park. And I wonder who that was. And then one time, you know, I just walked down there. I was young. And I walked down there. And I heard uh, they were, I think, or, or I just heard the mic and it was talking about this Africa, Bambata. You know, you know, ever since I heard that, the way I love music. I love music. I love all kinds of music. But I didn't know that you can, you know, play it back and forth like the way they was and that's what made me get in really want to get into it got you got you so what year would you say that you started djing wow uh i don't know i think it was 71 okay i think it was i think it was about 71 when i I got my first little cheap turntables it wasn't even a turntable it was a stereo about two stereos out the house Right. I was in I was in our basement apartment, just me and my me and my cousin, and we were just playing music and stuff. So, who would you say? Who would you say would be early influence on you? Um, I could say Bam's crew. Um, then you know, then I heard, then I started hearing. Um, cause like I said, I was I grew up in Soundview too. I grew up in Soundview, and I grew up on the other side of town too. Right. So my, my grandmother lived in Soundview, and my, my parents lived on the other side of town. And I was going back and forth. Then I started, you know, and I started hearing Herc. And, you know, and, and, and that's how things just got around, you know, just got me into doing what I, you know, what I'm doing now. Right, right. So we're talking about Soundview. This is the South Bronx, correct? Soundview is not the South Bronx. It's, it, it's cross town. <laughs> Where my mother lived at and all of that, that's the South Bronx. That's over there by Fort Apache and all of that. Right, right. Got you, got you. And that's where you're originally from, correct? Yes, yes. That's where I'm originally from. Interesting. Okay, so you say that you, you would say that you started DJing around 1971. Is that correct? Yes, something like that. Yes. What was your first DJ name? I didn't even really have a DJ name. My name was just B. You know, my name always been B. Okay. You know, and then they, they we just put everything else behind it. So where did the disco B come from? Was it the style of music, the time, or you know why did why did you decide to call yourself disco B? Oh, because Creole used to make a lot of jokes about me, and he used to call me the the disco B, and um and then all of a sudden it was just you know that I played a lot of I love playing the disco music, 
And then Creole used to say, yo, let's just call this, you know, call him Disco B. Gotcha. You know? And you told my kid Creole from the Furious Five. So, so I don't want to jump too far ahead. We'll get to that. So your early influences, you said, were Bambada um, as far as DJing. Okay. So you started DJing in 71. Now, this is really pre-hip-hop as we all know it, right? Uh, you know, hip-hop is credited to, you know, be started, you know, in 1973 with Cool Herc. So yes. so talk to me about pre-hip-hop. I mean, you're pre-hip-hop. So can you just give me, you know, just talk to me a little bit about the Bronx pre-hip-hop. When you say pre-hip-hop, to me, it was just playing music, you know, just getting all the, all the, the, the good sounds, all the good R&B music. And just playing it, just playing it, and and having fun. I I didn't even know it was hip hop. All I know is just that I was playing music because I like I like playing music. Got you. So what did the scene look like at that time? I mean, this is the early '70s because I've always believed that the '70s was really the most important time frame in music that built hip hop. Right. You know, again, what we call hip hop, because I know it wasn't called hip hop at that time. Right. So. No, it wasn't. Right. So what did the scene really look like in that early 70s for Disco B? For me, it was just just doing something that I love. It was, you know, it, it wasn't as hectic as it is now and not a bunch of people, you know, like trying to get down. It's just having fun. It's like saying, yo, man, we're going to have a. A fifty cent party in the basement to make a couple of dollars. Gonna play some music, yeah, okay. And they're just playing music off and on, you know, just putting the needle on the on the beginning of the records, finding the records that you know where the music starting the beginning and try to keep it on time and keep people dancing. Got you, got you. So, so how did you, you know, how, how did you create your own style as a DJ? You know, what what did you do to set yourself apart? you know, from any other DJs that were, you know, that were in the Bronx at that time? Well, now you're coming up a little further. I started watching everybody, everybody play. Everybody was trying to do certain things. And I learned a lot from watching everybody, especially watching um, Mean Gene, him when he was, when he was playing with Flash, just watching them and seeing how they do things. Cause I wanted to be, I wanted to be part of, you know, part of the play in the music in the park and everything. Right. So I just watched them and I started playing my music my way, what I like, you know, I like hip hop. I like all that, but when it came down to it, I can, I can do certain things, but having too many, you know, like it's like having, it's like cooking in the kitchen. You having like five people in the same neighborhood, all playing the same music. What is that? What is that going to do for you? So it's everybody just going to get better. You're going to be going, doing better and better, you know, doing, doing almost the same thing. If I hear this guy over here cutting like this, I'm going to try to cut like that. If I hear the guy over there cutting like that, damn, I want to try to cut like him too. So basically I just said, look, I'm just going to play music the way I feel. And the, if the music that sounds good to me, that's the way I like to play it. And I, like, I used to listen to a lot of Frankie Crocker on the radio and I liked the way he was playing his music. So I said, you know something, that's different. So I started playing like that. Got you. So again, you know, it's the early 70s. I keep saying pre-hip-hop, but I mean, you know, again, it, you know, that whole scene, you're talking about 71. It's the Bronx. You got park jams and clearly, you know, a lot of DJs and a lot of stuff going on. This is the scene, right? So you were there. Talk to me about 1973. Talk to me about the Cool Herc parties, you know, Bambada, the Zulu Nation, Bronx River. You know, did you ever go to any of Herc's parties? Talk to me about, you know, when this this thing gets coined to start this movement called hip hop. Well, I, I never, you know, my parents was a little, you know, they wouldn't let me stay out too late. Uh, so what it was is I never really went to too many parties unless a whole, like a whole bunch of us was going. So I, I was hanging, I was just hanging out, just being a person, just hanging out. I used to hang out with, with me and Gene and them. And uh, this is before they became the L brothers. So I used to hang out with them. My parents, and we used to all live in the same block, uh, same building and everything. So my parents would let us go, let me go with them to a party. You know, they would ask, say, yeah, um, can, can he come and go with us to a party? 
I used to go with them to a party and watch every, you know, we used to always dance a lot, like go to different parties and dance. I don't know all the DJs that was playing all the time, but some of the DJs, they was just playing and we just go there and just dance. And, um, and that, and that's, that's basically how it was, you know. And then after a while, like I said, I just, I used to always just listen to Gene and Flash, um, practice a lot. And it, to me, it wasn't like, uh, Grandmaster Flash, uh, you know, he was Grandmaster Flash. Back then, he was just Flash. Right, right. You know, he was Flash. And I liked the way he, you know, he created things and he made, he made, he made it more interested in, in me getting into music. Gotcha. So then I just, I just, you know, as, as it was going, it was, um, like I said, it was just me and Gene and Flash. And then all of a sudden, then me and Mean Gene's brother, Cordio, got in, you know, started playing, started doing a little neighborhood stuff and playing some music together. We was playing together. Um, and other than that, and then that's how, to me, that's how it got started for me. So was, was Cordio the first person that you got down with as a crew? Yes. Did you guys have a name at that time or was you just DJ B? <laughs> okay. It, it was just B and Cordy. Got you, got you. So you bring up Flash's name. So I understand that you were down with Flash or you DJed along with Flash. How did you meet DJ Flash, who then became Grandmaster Flash? How how did you meet Flash and how long did you work with him? Well, I met with I met Flash back in, you know, back in the days when I was to hang out with Gene and them. Because we used to live on, you know, we, we we let me see, we lived on Fox Street. We lived on Tiffany Street together. We lived on Fox Street together. And and we just I just every time we moved or something, we all still stayed around each other and we kept going to each other's house, just doing stuff. That's all. I just kept following them around because I kept me like I said, me and Cordy was down with each other and I would, you know, I would uh go and hang out with Cordy and I hear them playing, just listening to what they're doing, finding out the records to buy and everything. Got you. Got you. So I want to get back to Flash, but I want, I wanted to bring up a few names to you. And, and then I wanted to, you know, just kind of get some feedback on some of these names. Cause again, we're, we, you know, this is the early seventies, right? Um, hip hop is just starting, you know, again, what we call hip hop, this is the Bronx. So you had already brought a Bambada. We talked about Herc a little bit and, you, you brought up Mean Gene and Flash, but I'm going to bring up a couple names, but I'm going to bring up DJ Hollywood, Lovebug Starsky, DJ Baron and Breakout, Pete DJ Jones, Grandmaster Flowers, Plumber, Disco King Mario. And um, what, what do these names mean to you? Well, Disco King Mario was around. He was around for, to me. The first time I ever seen him was in Metcalf Park. That's the same park that I've seen, first seen Van Bottom play at. And I've seen Disco King Mario. Um, I remember him. Uh, Grandmaster Flowers, I, you know, he was from Brooklyn, but I never went out to Brooklyn. I have family in Brooklyn, but I never went out there and heard him play. Uh, Flash, Flash liked it. Um, he liked it, Grandmaster Flowers. Okay. Okay. But, you know, and uh, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't know about Pete, Pete DJ Jones yet. Hollywood, I didn't know about yet. Um, it was just, you know, it, it's it's a different part of the music of where we was playing. We was playing, wasn't playing in clubs. We wasn't playing. We was doing house parties and stuff like that. We wasn't nowhere near clubs or nothing. We did a lot of house parties. Then um, when I started meeting a lot of people, or we started doing more, building up, you know, building up the name is when Flash. And Gene, I guess they felt they fell through, and we started, you know. Then I, all of a sudden, I don't know how how it happened, but we got together and we started doing stuff. I started following behind him, doing stuff with him. And what and what, sudden, what year would you say that you got down with Flash officially? Officially, I I don't know. I think it was I don't know seventy three. Got you. Okay. Seventy three, seventy four. I'm not even sure no more, man. 
Got it. Okay. So, so you know, again, I bring up these names because, you know, in hip-hop history, there, there's a lot of people that are highlighted. There's some people that are forgotten, and there's some people that aren't mentioned at all. And, you know, and then there's some people that are lightly mentioned, you know. You know, like yourself, Disco B. I mean, I, I don't think you get the credit that you deserve, and we're going to continue to get into that. And I think you're, you know, you are a name that should be mentioned when we talk about, you know, the founding fathers or the foundation of hip-hop. So, so right. I, you know, again, you know, just like uh, you know, DJ Baron and Breakout and, you know, Love Bug Starsky and, and there's so many more. Is there is there any anyone that I missed that should be mentioned from from your, you know, that beginning era that was doing it out there with you? Well, my thing is it's like like me, like like Red Alert. He was he was in the back in the background just like I was. He was doing his thing, but we they wasn't recognizing him the way he's supposed to be because there was people in front of him. Right, right. You know, it's like there's always people. It was always people in front of me because I wasn't trying to be a superstar. I was just trying to be good and trying to play. That's all. I just wanted to have fun. Got you. Understood. Okay. So talk to me a little bit about, you know, this time frame with Grandmaster Flash. Um, talk to me about the Furious Five. You know, when they were three MCs, then four, then five. Talk to me about, you know, this this time frame. Because, you know, again, this is the 70s. We're now, I would say, in the mid-70s. So talk to me about this whole, you know, process. Well, the process, from what I remember, you know, I, I'm trying to get it all together. Let me see what I remember. All I know is that me and Flash was doing a lot of stuff. was doing a lot of stuff. We was down with somebody called uh, Montague Productions or something like that. And we were just doing little parties and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden, uh, I think we was doing something, a block party or something, and Cowboy got on the mic. And he used to, like, just hype up the crowd. But like I said, most of this stuff, it, it's been so long ago, it's hard to remember everything. But basically what I can say is the, when the Grandmaster Flash, Disco B, and the three MCs, when we came together and came out, that was it. That was it. That's all. That's that's basically all we needed. That was our five people right there that we took care of. We took care of everything that we needed to. Now it was time to blow up. Right. Gotcha. When, when Flash realized it and we, we all realized it, we was like, yo, we got something right here. Now it's, it's time for us to fucking blow up. So we just, we just was just doing our thing and having fun. And we, we blew up fast. I remember a lot of times me and Flash used to just go out and we tried to go to the damn movies together. And we'll go to the movies just to go see a movie. We'll be on 42nd Street at the movies. And people will be like, oh, shit, it's Grandmaster Flash and Disco B. Yo, they back there. Because we should sit all the way in the back. Right, so okay. The movie and not to be bothered. But we never noticed that all these people knew really who we was, and they used to come to our parties. I didn't know we was that big. I thought we were just, you know, the, the Bronx people, neighborhood people that played music. Mm, okay. Yeah, we was really large, and 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 it was like, you know, if you look at a lot of flyers, there's a whole lot of flyers with, you know, Grandmaster Flash, Disco Beat, and the three MCs. We stayed like that for a long time. Because that was it. That was the chemistry right there. That was the making of something great. Right, right. And that was Grandmaster Flash, Disco B, Keith Cowboy, Kid Creole, and Melly Mel, correct? Correct, correct. So I understand that uh, you used to do, uh, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, you used to do routines with Flash, Easy Mike during the Furious Five shows. Is that correct? We used to do routines before that when it was just the three MCs and Grandmaster Flash just go be an easy mic too. We did routines. Me and Flash did routines. Uh, Flash, you know, make, maybe came up with something and said, yo, let's try this. Okay, cool. And we tried it. Then we had the, you know, because the MCs was always doing something <laughs> that made the DJs look bad. So we had to make, <laughs> we had to make them look bad. Okay. So we did a lot of things. Um, that nobody never tried or did, and I, 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 like I said, the magic was there. I don't know what happened to it after that, you know, but the magic was there. Um, maybe that we lost the magic when we became, you know, Grandmaster Flash. This could be in the four MCs, whatever. I don't know. Right, right. Well, well, let let me ask you a question. 
So were you there? Did you see Flash actually, you know, create this new style of, of you know, what we would call turntablism now? But but how did you feel when Flash was just basically spinning and doing things that nobody else was doing? You were down with him. So I know it was kind of competitive, you know, internally, but in a, and I know you kept up clearly, but how did you feel, you know, was it like a competitive edge that you had over everyone else? Well, the thing about it is, like I said before, I seen everything that he can do. Even when, when, when he wasn't around, the equipment was like up at, you know, at my house. And when nobody was around, I, I, I knew he was up in the middle of the night doing something. I might have been thought you think I was asleep, but I heard what he was doing. And then when nobody's there, I get up and try to do what he was doing. Right. But then, I, then I thought about it. I was like, you know something? It doesn't make no sense because we're gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna be really like turning into a competition if I tried to master what he learned, what he, what he taught himself, and what he was doing. Right. So for me to stay with this group and learn more, okay, there need to be two different styles of DJ, and let Flash do his thing. He's the headliner. He's the grandmaster. I'm just disco B. When it's time for me to play, I'm going to play my way. Because you got millions of people. Everybody don't want to hear one way this DJ is playing. They might want to hear what I'm playing, you know. Gotcha. They might say, you know, you, know you, 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 can, you can burn, you can, you know, kill a party real quick if both of us are playing the exact same way. So my thing is I love disco music and I love playing R&B music. I used to, like I said, you should listen to LIV and all of that stuff. And there was other records to be played that he probably didn't play. Right, right. We played a lot of underground music, but there was records that he, he wouldn't play. So the records that he wouldn't play, I would play those. Gotcha. And I noticed that a lot of people wanted to hear it. And it gives him a break from have to, you know, play like that. You can't play like that for eight hours in a party. Right, you absolutely. Know? So if I played and took a break, you know, gave him a break and played. I played a whole complete different way than he did. Tried to keep it almost, com you know, compatible of what he was doing, but stay away from what he was doing because I didn't want it to be some kind of competition between both of us doing stuff. Right, right. Well, let me just say this. You know, again, I, I just don't think that you get the credit that you deserve. I mean, you rocked along with Flash and you headlined with Flash for years, right? And and, right. and what I mean by this is that, you know, I've seen hundreds of classic flyers with your name on it right next to Flash. You know, some of these flyers, and let me just name a few of some of these flyers of some of these historic nightclubs and places and community centers that you played at. You know, again, this is Grandmaster Flash, you know, and DJ Disco B. So, you know, we talk about like the Columbus Boys Club, the Black Door, the PAL, the Autobahn, the, the Fever, the Montreal Center, the Dixie uh, <laughs> Studio 25. I mean, just to name a few. Did I, did I leave any out? Even all the high schools. Right, right. Uh, we played together in all the high schools, but we did what we had to do, you know, and I did what I had to do to stay, you know, to stay in the limelight. This, this thing was, you know, I didn't know it was going to be this thing. My parents was like, ah, y'all playing that damn jungle music and there ain't nobody going to respect y'all doing that, you know, and I was like, it's just a lot of stuff I had to deal with. Right, right. And, and look what it came, look what it became. Absolutely. And and that was my point of bringing up, you know, again, I know that there was, you know, dozens and dozens of other clubs and bars and lounges and, you know, not to mention all the park jams that y'all did. Right. But right. But I, I just wanted to mention some of those historic, you know, uh, places that you played at equal billing with Flash. Right. And, you know, again, this is DJ Disco B. Um, and, and I know that there was a lot of classic, classic moments like at the Autobahn, you know, and a few other ones that actually changed, you know, hip hop forever. And with saying that, I just wanted to, you know, salute you, you know, for being there doing all of those events. It's not like there's no proof. I mean, there's hundreds of flyers with your name on it. That's exactly that's exactly when I got put into the, um, the hip hop museum in, in Washington, D.C. That's exactly what the guy was saying. He was saying, you know, people can say what they want, 
but this is the one man that I can tell you, his proof right here. 90% of every, all the flyers that he's seen, 90% of them flyers got my name on them, you know? And I'm like, wow. You know. right, right, right. And and, and and B, I don't mean to cut you off, but I got to add this to it, too. You played along with Grandmaster Flash, who changed hip hop history. Well, he actually helped create it. Create it. Right. Yes. He, he changed how DJs. Let me say this. He helped create hip hop culture and hip hop, but he changed the landscape of how DJs played music. Right. Yes, because he, we was like, and, and it's something that he said a long time ago. Here's something we got to do because all these DJs are playing, but they're not putting stuff on time. They just cutting people's feet and they're like tripping over their feet when they come in with the new record. And when he started, he started doing, he started inventing, he tried to invent something. He made something because we didn't have money to go out and buy the, the equipment that probably had it already built in. We didn't have money like that. Right, right. And he he he, he invented that the, the the thing to listen to the um, the other record so we can hit it on time. The, you the, know, yeah, the queuing system. The queuing system, right? Right, right, right. And once that was done, I loved it because you can and and the thing about it, you can hear a lot of stuff that's in your ear. You just are like, oh wow, what if I try that? Let's see what happens. And he did that. Whatever he heard in his ear, he might have went back. He said, oh, shit, if I do that loud, will it sound good? And that's what made it better because he started, you know, whatever he was hearing out of his ear, he said, hey, let me put a little, you know, while the record was playing. And not just do it. You had to make it sound good. And, you know, like I said, he, he, he made things sound better. And then after a while, he just, oh, God, he just, he made it, 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 it was so great, you know. Right. I even, I even said, I got to, I have to put that into whatever type of music that I'm playing. I want to put that into it. That's one of the things that I probably took from him, even playing my smooth music, you know, because I, I understood what that meant, and it, and it helped. They help the music sound better. Got you, got you. Absolutely. Incredible, incredible. So, you know, again, I just wanted to mention that because, you know, you're playing along with, you know, you would say the baddest DJ at the time. This is Grandmaster Flash and Disco B, right? So it's just, it's incredible. And, and the proof is right there. All the flyers, all the events, everybody was around at that time. They know your history, you know, and your legacy and, you know, Hopefully you'll get the credit, you know, that you deserve, you know, one day and I know it's coming. So let me ask you this. Who was the first person you actually saw rap? The first rapper, first MC ever? Wow. Uh, well, it wasn't a rapper. Well, the first person I ever seen just talk on the mic was Cowboy. And the person, the first person I ever seen put stuff in rhymes was Creo. Got you. Okay. So again, th what's so incredible about what you're saying is, is that these are the guys who was down with you and Flash. So once again, you're the best DJs and you got the best the best rapper. So you become the best crew in the Bronx at the time, right? Yes. Yes. On one, on our side of town, we was the best crew because you had you had so many different crews because you had Breakout Uptown, Bambine Across Town, uh, uh, Herc on the other side of the town. It was like, it's like a square. Everything was like a square. And we rocked everything that until you get to the middle of the square, that was all of us. And they rocked everything until they got to the middle of the square, that was all of their, all of their area. Until everybody met in the middle. Till one day we all finally did meet in the middle, going to different places. So if you look at Flyers, we did play in, you know, we played with Herc. We played in uh, with with Bambada. We played with Mario, and we played with Breakout. Wow, wow, it's amazing, amazing. It's hip hop, right? I mean, you right. know, it became hip hop, the hip hop culture, and it's just amazing. And and you know, again, salute to you. You were there, and you're a part of this, the creation and the foundation. So let me ask you this: How did things change for Disco B 
seeing that you were down with Grandmaster Flash and again, you know, the, the, the three MCs, you know, the Furious Four and then the Furious Five. How did things change for you once, you know, you guys started making records? You know, once the, you know, the Enjoy record deal came and then a little later the Sugar Hill record came and now you're recording and taking the stuff from the park to the studio and making records. How did it, how did everything change for Disco B? I branched off and started playing playing by myself. I, you know, but off and on, me and Flash was still doing things together certain times. I might, you know, we was, you know, he'll, he'll like, yo, B, I need you with me. All right. Let's go. So Disco B, talk to me about the 80s for you. Uh, I mean, you know, because, again, we talked about the early 70s. We talked about your beginning. We talked about you um, down with Mean Gene. We talked about you down with Grandmaster Flash before he was Grandmaster Flash. We talked about the Furious Five before they were the Furious Five. We talked about all of the events and all of the parties and things that you did in the 70s. Now, let's talk about the 80s. So now in the 80s, we got, you know, we have records now. We have movies like Wild Style, Beat Street, Break It, Crush Groove. We have hip-hop tours. We have videos and more. What was the 80s like for you? The 80s like for me, after, you know, I started playing, I was doing my regular thing, you know, just playing all around, playing for people. Um, Sometimes I might play for... I, I, I was doing a little bit of doing a little bit with everybody. Uh, still doing stuff with Flash. Uh, then I end up doing stuff with Melly Mel. Then I end up doing stuff with Curtis. Then I end up doing stuff with the Sugar Hill Gang. I was I was playing for a lot of people, but my main my main objective of the eighties was Disco Fever. Nice. Okay. I went in there and I was playing in Disco Fever. Okay, so talk to me about that. Talk to me about about the Fever and, and Disco B. That was the fever. I was like, I used to just go there. I was with, I was there with Flash when Flash used to play there. I used to help. Sometimes I used to go in there and help him. And then after a while, uh, Junebug, he used to say, yo, B, yo, man, um, I'm going to be late. I got some things I got to do. Can you go and start the fever for me? I was like, what? Yeah, go ahead, man. You, yo, man, you you good enough to, because I never played in a club before. Like, you know, we played, but I'm talking about play. Like, right, right. Still. We did our thing, but I'm talking about sitting still. So I started playing in there. Um, he let me play for him until he got there. He might be two hours late, three hours late. So the club opened up at, at nine. I might play until about 12. Wow. I mean, that's, that's a good time frame. And what year would you say and, this is? Wow, this was like probably 82. Okay, got you. Go ahead. And, you know, I started, you know, we we had the upstairs. I played, and I used to be like one, what the, the kind of DJ I was in there was like, um, like I wasn't really a DJ in there yet. What it was was when, D, when DJs are supposed to play there, I was there because me and Squeegee, we was friends, and we used to sit down and talk and, and everything. And what happens is DJs don't come on time. Club open up at nine o'clock. There's no damn DJ. That's how I got started playing in Disco Fever. Because Sweet G's and them, used, the managers used to say, yo, B, get up there and start playing, please. And it just started happening so much. B, get up there and start playing. And after a while, I just started, you know, getting my own little program together, you know, and keeping it and saying like, oh, I'm going to go play. Oh, shit. Let me get my shit. You know, I got my records, I got all my stuff, um, and I was, you know, I was playing stuff that these guys didn't even have because I was in the record pool. And mm, okay, when they found when one day I was doing something, I went somewhere, and the people was like, "Yo, ain't you Disco B?" I said, "Yeah." Don't you play? You used to play with Flash. I said, "Yeah." And that, you know, then it was like, "Yo, you you playing Disco Fever now, right? Yo, you want to join our record pool?" I was like, join your record pool. Okay. I joined the record pool. And I started, you know, getting a whole lot of, you know, like, I was the first person that bought, that you ever heard in the Bronx, that record rising to the top. I'm the one that brought that to Disco Fever. And I played it in there first time. And you're talking about Kenny Burke, Keep Rising to the Top, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very nice. It was a lot of records I brought in there. I, I brought a lot of records out that nobody was thinking about because that's the type of music that I like. Right, right. You're talking about early 80s R&B, right? Right. 
Right. Yeah, absolutely. And and and, and basically, early '80s R&B end up turning into damn hip hop records. Correct. Absolutely, all of them. There's a lot of records that I played that people was like, "Oh, sweat, that shit is nice." It's like Level Forty Two, that record Star Child. I started playing that. People was like, Yo, "What the hell is that?" And they started like listening to it. I played it so much they was like, "Yo, that shit is." And you cutting it back and forth, and then then sometimes you let the words play. They like. Yo, this joint is nice. If you got a nice system behind you, right. yo, that shit will sound dope. If you got a nice system behind you, it'll sound dope. So would you say the fever solidified, you know, DJ Disco B as a standalone entity of your own? I mean, I know you were already doing it with Flash and you were doing yeah. it before Flash, but would you say that the fever, because I saw your name on that famous sign. And uh, yeah. so, so would you say the fever really solidified you? Yes, yes. Wow. Because after, after a while, even though all the big time DJs was upstairs, it gave me downstairs. I used to tear that. I had downstairs rocking. Nice. Incredible. You know, I let every, 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 every MC that, that couldn't get on the mic upstairs would come downstairs and get on the mic for me and show what they got. And I let them, I let them go. Wow, that's amazing. So you obviously were doing what DJ, real DJs do, breaking records and, and really yes. solidifying, you know, your position. Yes. And now we're talking about, again, what, you know, early 80s. We're talking about the disco fever. This is the Bronx and it's disco B. That's amazing. Yes. So now let's, let's, talk about a, let's talk about a record that you made. So you did a record with Star Child called B-Boy Breakers, produced by Larry Smith came out on uh, Quality Records in 1984. Talk to me about this record. How did it happen? It, it, was, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't planned or nothing. It, it was supposed to be. It was a joke. I thought it was a joke. We was in, Larry was at my house because I guess we was hanging out or something, and he stayed at my house, and Star Child was, lived, lived with me too. And we just, he just said, yo, I got to go to the studio. He said, yo, man, check this out. Let's go to the studio and make a record. So we said, yeah, we'll go with you to the studio. But we didn't know we was really going to go make a record. And we really went there and made a record. Wow, wow. So Larry Smith produced the track. So, the tr you know, what, yeah. what was your involvement in the actual record? I did all the, um, all the, like, all the break, all the breaks in the record. Right, right, okay. Yeah, I did all the breaks in the record. Very nice. So? If you listen to the record, you'll, see, you'll hear how all the breaks are laying on top of each other. Yeah, all the, yes. That's me. And the thing about the way I did it, I didn't like chop it in, sample. I spin, I spin back, you know, like, you know, like we, like we do at a party. I cut the records like exactly how we did at a party on that record. Wow, that's dope. So what was the, what, what was the, the feedback from the record? How, how was it accepted? How did it do? It did pretty good here for a little, you know, it was all right here. People loved the melody, but I didn't, I didn't really like the words. I think the words could have been a little better, but the record overseas, that shit was, it was like hot. And it's probably still hot overseas. So why didn't you make more records? I don't know. I really don't know. Wow. Wow. So, so you went into the studio, didn't plan on making a record, made a record. And then the next thing you knew, it just came out on vinyl. I mean, how did it, you know, how did it happen? Well, Larry was like playing with it. He said, yo man, let's go find a label for this here. So this just sounds good. Okay, cool. And he went and then he came and told us, he said, yo, he came and brought us, he brought me, I was at the fever playing. He said, here, I said, Oh, you brought me a copy of the record. Because I had the I had the press, the big press, the plastic that the, the, the demo. Right, the test pressing. Yeah, the the, yeah, the, the acetate, acetate probably. Right. Yes, sir. And he brought me the records. Yo, what's up with this label? He said, Yo, you on quality records? I was like, Oh well, I wasn't there to sign anything, but okay. And he took care of everything. I mean, this is Larry Smith, the incredible producer. Rest in peace. Produced yes. Houdini, Run DMC, the Fat Boys, Curtis Blow, and on and on and on. That's, that's right. Yeah, that's incredible. Incredible. So, uh, well, you know, at least at least you had one shot at making a record. You know what I mean? And and that that's a uh, Star Child and Disco B B Boy Breakers, produced by Larry Smith, 1984. Dope classic record. Yes. So, how did you transition through the late 80s? 
in the 90s up until now. What has kept Disco B busy over all these years? What kept me busy? My wife. You know, because I was, I was ready to give up. I was tired. You know, I wasn't getting the recognition. And nobody was, you know, every time I hear a hip-hop story, it's like out of everything. It's like I didn't exist. And I just got fed up with it, man, you know. Do you still DJ but, to this day? Well, I, I, I DJ, but I don't, I don't, um, I still have my equipment. I do go in there and practice sometimes. But since I had the stroke, I'm not, not like 100%. I'm only like 80, 75%. Okay, I'm sorry. I didn't know that. You know, my hands, my, you know, my left side is not as good no more. It, it's just, you know, I had a TAI stroke, a T, T, TAI or TAA or whatever. It's a, it's a brain stroke. Mm, okay. I don't, I don't think as good as I do when I'm, when I'm listening, you know, trying to, you know, get records together like I used to. Well, I'm sure you still have it because you're still the legendary disco B, right? Yes. <laughs> my, my wife, my wife told me she said, "Look, just go there and play like you know, like you, you know, things that you already know. Go back to the beginning and play." And I said, okay. And I started playing, like, going back to the beginning and just trying to get things together. Don't try to do nothing fancy. Just play. And that's it. Do you still have all your original records? I have most of them um, because uh, when I moved down here, I think 2001, there was a hurricane came through my where I live at. And it, and it went right right around my house and picked up my shed where I had all my records in and tossed it all over the backyard. But wow. I, I probably have about 20 crates left out of 100. Wow, wow. I hate to hear that because I'm sure those 20 crates of records are priceless. I just looked at them a couple of days ago. Man. I looked at some of them a couple of days ago. I was like, wow. Yeah, I'm sure, you, I'm sure you got a lot of classics in there. You know what I mean? Oh, I do. I do. I do. And, I, and then one of, my, one of my best friends moved down here, and he brought some records with him. And we sit and we DJ together sometimes. He'll come and he'll see me DJ come in. I say, "Hey man, just play." Um, I don't know if you know him, but um, DJ Stevie Steve, he played for Double Trouble in them. Right, right, okay. Yeah, absolutely. And you're in the Carolinas now. Yes. So, uh, so recently, Disco B, you were recognized at the museum in D.C. with a uh, Master Ace, right? Talk to me about, you know, how did that happen? What was your feelings about it? You were finally recognized. So talk to me about that. Well, from what I hear is that first, the first thing, nobody knew where I was at. Every time they used to ask people questions about, yo, man, have you heard from Disco B? And nobody would say nothing, even though some people knew where I was at, but um, one person came out and found me in North Carolina because he lived in um, he lived in uh, South Carolina, Columbia, and his name is Mark Skills. Okay. He writes that ma um, a hip hop magazine, and he just happened to get my number from somebody, and he called me, and he drove down to my house, and we sat down and we talked. We talked for a long time. So he every time certain things happen, he would like you know he would call, call me and ask me about certain things in hip hop and about, you know, when he's doing certain stories. So then he, he kept me going. And then people was like asking, like when they, they'll say like, yo, I heard you wrote a story about Disco B. Do you know, if, is he around? Will he talk to us? He will call me and ask me to, you know, do they want to talk to me? And I say, yeah, okay, cool. I'll talk to him. So then Jaquan, his, his people, they was like, when they was opening up the museum, they was looking at the flyers, and they're like, yo, man, I'm looking at hundreds of flyers. Right. And by me looking at, by they looking at hundreds of flyers, they're saying like, yo, out of hundreds of flyers, there's one name that keeps coming up, but there's no pictures of him. There's nothing of what, you know, no stories about him or anything. And that's how it became. They wanted, they wanted to know about Disco B. So they asked Jaquan, then Jaquan did a story on me. And then they, they, they seen, you know, pictures of me and they was like, yo. And then they was doing um, something. They was doing a wall in the museum of flyers. And when they was putting the flyers up, I guess, and they looked around, they was like, yo, <laughs> we got hundreds, thousands of flyers. Yo, 90% of these flyers got this man right here, his name on it. Right, right. We got to get this guy. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you know, well-deserved. 
I mean, like I had mentioned before, that's why I brought up all the flyers and the flyers are very important because it is the proof of hip hop history. It's it's the scrolls. It's the documents. Right. I mean, right. you know, when we go back and look at footage, it's how you prove history. You know, the history is there. You know what I mean? And you are a part of the foundation and the creation of hip hop. And hip hop is the biggest form of music to date in the world. You know, it, it, it generates the most revenue and it's the most listened to genre of music in the world. And you were a part of the foundation and the creation of this. It's very important, B. It's great that they recognized you because you deserve it. And, uh, and I know there's going to be more to come. So congratulations on that. And that particular exhibit is still up right now in D.C. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Because they was talking about once they um once this COVID stuff is over, that all the people that got inducted, they was gonna bring probably bring them all back to have one big gigantic party. Yeah, yeah, that would be amazing. Cause I, you know, I saw some of the pictures. Of course, I've seen the flyers over the history. Um, I know Flash personally. And and by the way, salute to DJ Red Alert, cause Red Alert is the one who called me and was like, "Yo, Rip, you really need to interview Disco B for Vinyl Esquire." You know what I mean? Cause you know he knows I I interview nothing but the legends, and I always try to keep it authentic and recognize the DJ culture properly. And you deserve your flowers while you're here. So. <laughs> <laughs> so salute to you, Disco B. Yo, you're the second person that said that. I said, oh, are y'all talking about you deserve to get your flowers before you die? Yes, sir. Oh. That's absolutely right. As you know, you I'm sure you well know, in our culture, you know, we don't naturally appreciate things until they're gone. So we need to start appreciating while you're here so you can feel like all those years you put in all that time. And I don't know your sacrifices and we don't even need to talk about it, but we've all had them. So no matter what you've done, it needs to be recognized so you inside can feel good that you, you know, you participated in something amazing that changed the world. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's what, that's, that's what, you know, my, my wife was always telling me that she said, B, you are in, you are somebody and, you know, and I see how, cause we did, uh, we did one show one time and even though they introduced you know they introduced the group and class my wife said when they introduced it, me on the stage with them she said she was she was up in the um stands she was up on top she just chilled she said the people there were so many people went crazy when they heard my name that i was dead and she was like oh shit this could be easier and nice B, yo, B, yo, B, yo, because a lot of them remember me from Disco Fever, right. and a lot of them remember me from just being at the parties and going to certain parties. You know, like a lot of times, when, even when we did stuff at Madison Square Garden, I used to walk, I walk outside or be coming in, they like, yo, B, I, I couldn't get a ticket and blah, blah, blah. And it all depends on who you was. And, and usually I'll be like, yo, they with me. Come on. Right, right. Wow. I, I mentioned all those events that you did, and I forgot Madison Square Garden. Whoa. Not only yeah. the biggest one, but go ahead. Like Madison Square Garden, even when we even when we did stuff at the Apollo. Yes, um, yes. You know, we did a lot of little things, just me and Flash sometimes, just going going to places. And this is, I guess this is, this is still during the time when the group broke up. And Flash, okay. when Flash was still doing his thing. He started bringing me along with him, and I, I thought that was nice that he brought me along. You know, I didn't want no pity from him, but, you know, I was happy that he, you know, he at least kept me in the limelight for a little while. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. You know, I was happy. I was happy. And I, I was more happy when people, because even to right now, like recently about, a not even a year ago, yeah, probably was a year ago, Flash posted a picture, and... And we went somewhere with Flash, uh, me and Mike. And it was like there, it was like a whole big talk. Flash, Mike and B is together. Oh shit, something is getting ready to happen. We need to know. We need to find out. <laughs> right, right. We was just together being friends. Wow, it's incredible. Well, I'm sure y'all be together doing something again in the near future. You know what I mean? So, so to this. Me, I don't, I don't... I don't put my hopes up a lot on on this anymore because I'm just tired of heartbreak. This I love this. 
I love playing music. I don't really, you know, I still get nervous when I play. But I wow. Don't, and if I mess up, I had, I had a bad, well, like, I had one bad show that I did right right after the stroke because I promised that I would do it. And I should have known I shouldn't have did it, but I didn't want everybody to know that I had a stroke. Mm, okay. But I didn't do as good as I should have. I feel bad for that because it, it looked bad on me. But I, I don't believe it tarnished your legacy, though. You know what I mean? Well, people got to understand you do have a bad, you, you, you do have good days and you have bad days. Absolutely. I mean, even the best. Not every DJ has a great night. Right. No question. I mean, this could be, you've done so much, you know, for hip hop that people know about and that people don't know about that, you know, this could be, is always going to go down as, as a part of hip hop history and the DJ culture. You know what I mean? No question about it. So, so this will be, what, what's in the near future for you? You know, you have any new projects that you're working on? What can we look forward to from Disco B? <laughs> right, right now, all Disco B is doing right now is relaxing and playing with my new grandson. That's, that's basically right now. That's all I'm doing. Very nice. Very you know, nice. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to recover from the stroke. I'm trying to recover and I want, you know, my wife said, your ass going to be around for a long time. I said, yeah, I hope so. <laughs> but I think I'm so. Just, I'm just relaxed. I'm trying. I, I'm, my whole thing is I'm not letting anybody mess up what I feel right now. I'm, I'm, I'm happy that people are recognizing me. I'm really happy. Um, I don't want nobody to shoot it down. I'm not going to shoot nobody else down. Right, um, right. Uh, there is people that's probably saying, well, how the hell did he get in there and I didn't get in there? You got to understand, a lot of people a lot of people even say it to me that you might have had more popular stuff than you might have did, you know, was in the line life, in the pictures and everything, but I wasn't, you know, I had things I had to do. Right, right. And I wasn't trying to take nothing from nobody. I wasn't trying to take the line life from nobody. I wanted everybody to get equal equal amount of everything. Well, you know, to me, if you deserve it, you deserve it, right? I mean, a lot of this has to do with timing, relationships, you know, who knows who, what's happening. I mean, it's just like them recognizing you. They, you know, they're doing one thing. They see they're putting up all the flyers, and then they see your name, and then it, it just kind of just was like, yo, we got to recognize him. Now, if they wouldn't have been doing this, maybe they wouldn't have recognized you, or maybe you'd be recognized eventually, right? Right. But, but exactly. But but you know, I mean, a lot of people gravitate towards the popular names first all the time. You know, that's why a lot of the endorsements and the sponsors and you know the brand partnerships they always go after the popular names to sell things, and they right. and they leave out a lot of the people that actually built. And actually were there. Look, you were there before Flash. You were there with Flash the whole way in the 70s and the 80s, right? And then right. You, you did your own thing. You made your own record. And, you know, you're a part of hip-hop history. They can't bring up Flash's name without mentioning Disco B. They, right. can't, they can't bring up the Fever without bringing up Disco B. Now, they can bring up the Fever, and they got a 100 other names to add to it, right? So, you know, again, I salute you, and I can't say it, you know, too many times. You know, you, you deserve to be recognized, and, and I'm here to recognize you. So, as far as hip-hop is concerned, in your humble opinion, do you feel like the hip-hop story you know, hip hop history. Do you feel like it's been told correctly? Um, do you feel like it's been told as is about as correct as it can be? Or do you feel like it's just it was has it been romanticized? You know, has it been exaggerated? <laughs> you know what I mean? So so again, humbly, how how do you feel overall? What it is is that some people, whatever they seen, that's how they're going to tell the story. Okay, got you. That's what I feel. That's, that's what I feel about. Because a lot of times when I listen to some of these stories, I'm like, huh? Okay, I know I was there, but I don't remember that happening. Right, right. I got you. I Maybe I was drunk or whatever. <laughs> I don't know. Right. You know, but I don't remember that happening. And I don't remember... There's a lot of people I know that when they, when they talk about hip hop, they're the first ones on the stage. They got making you know commercials with them or interviews with them all over the TV, and they're saying I I you know I notice a lot of people out there is saying I I I I right um you know why don't some of y'all just tell the truth about you know who was there mm. who did this who helped 
create it, who helped put it where it stands. Um, that's all. I, I'm not going to say it was a bunch of lies because some of it could be true. Some of it can't be true. There's so many yeah. people, so many people were involved. There's so many different perspectives, right? Right. So Disco B, before we get out of here, can you give me one story from your past? One amazing story that our listeners would enjoy that you don't think people know. It doesn't matter. From the time you started DJing till now, can you give me one classic hip-hop story from your past? <laughs> from my past. What? i give you one story. We did, we, I, you know, we did a, um, a European tour. Me and Flash, Curtis Blow. <laughs> nice. Okay. And, All right. And, and the Sugar Hill Gang. Okay. So we're doing the show, but the Sugar Hill Gang is supposed to be the the headliners. Me, Flash, and Curtis get up there, and we doing our thing. And then the people, the people, you know, for the the production company was like, uh, excuse me, can we talk for a minute? You know, like, yeah, what's up? We need y'all to go on last. We're like, why? They're the headliners. Uh, no, we need y'all to go on last. <laughs> because our show was so great mm. and it was just one rapper two djs but our show was so good that when the other people got on the stage people started leaving wow okay i got you and they was like um just you know and they was like yo it didn't happen once it didn't happen twice it didn't happen it, it ha and we was on tour for about maybe 30 days 30 30 35 40 days and they said the first couple of shows, they said, yo, we need y'all the headline. Okay. You know, but okay, so, they, could, they could still have the headline, but we need y'all to go on last. Okay, so hold on. So this is Grandmaster Flash, Disco B, and Curtis Blow. Yes. So was this, when was this? Was this pre-Furious 5? Was this after that? Like, how did you two and Curtis Blow end up on tour together, performing together? Well, this is, this is after the group. I think this is after the group broke up. Okay, when, got you. All right. But giving you a story that y'all that you probably don't know, Curtis Blow used to be down with the Grandmaster Flash crew. Curtis Blow and Cool Kyle used to be down with Grandmaster Flash's crew. Mm. When Curtis Blow left, he made Christmas rapping. Wow, I didn't know that. Okay. Yes. Curtis was already down with us. We we knew Curtis. We knew how Cur I knew Curtis. I knew what Curtis could do. Flash knew Curtis, so but basically all we had to do was talk about what we wanted to do, and you know, and 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 it and it worked out, you know, for it only be one rapper, and we was doing our thing. Wow. So so when y'all were on tour, y'all would perform. I mean, clearly all of his hits, and then you would DJ. You would you guys would do a whole lot of stuff, correct? Yes, we'll do some of our own records. And we do the uh, wheels, uh, what do you call it? The wheels of steel? Yeah, Adventures, Adventures of Grandmaster Flash on the wheels of steel, yes. Right, sometimes he'll do that, you know. And we do some of Curtis's records, Flash's, you know, Flash records. We'll just play a little bit of it. Curtis might say a couple of lyrics from one of the records. Right. And that, and that was it. Wow, that's incredible. Wow. Was, yeah. that, was that the end of the story? I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, that was that. That's that's it. That 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 was just one good story right there. To have two different groups, Curtis's Curtis and Flash, with me in there playing, you know, like like the old days. Right, right. So talking about the old days. On that note, so let let me highlight this before we get out of here. Okay, so you said that Curtis Blow and Cool Cow, right? Uh huh. Was down with Flash. Before he made Christmas rapper, so you're talking about the late '70s, right? So yeah, somewhere around there. If you look at look at look at um, one of the flyers from the PAL, and you'll see Curtis Blow name on the flyer with us. Curtis Blow, Easy Mike, everybody on that fly. Disco B, Easy Mike, Curtis Blow, and Cool Kyle, Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, Disco B, Easy Mike, Cool Kyle. I mean, Curtis Blow and Cool Kyle. Nice, nice, incredible. See, again, more history, you know, that just needs to be told. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, so Disco B, I want to thank you for allowing me to interview you for Vinyl Esquire because, you know, you're a legendary DJ and, you know, you don't get mentioned like you should. 
So I wanted to make sure that we interviewed you and highlighted you. So, you know, you get, you know, as it's coming along, I mean, clearly, you, you know, you were recognized in D.C. at the museum. So, so clearly, you know, the Disco B story is slowly but surely coming out. And we'll all get a chance to understand, you know, who Disco B really is and what part you played in hip hop history and what you did for the DJ culture. Thank you. So how can our listeners continue to follow you? Uh, just just wait until you see some interviews on me. I, I try to stay, you know, I, I try to stay with myself right now until, until it's time to come out. You know, when I do, that's why I do a lot of interviews when people, like, people call and ask, you know, can we do an interview? Yes. But I don't do anything else. I just relax. I, like I said, I'm just trying to recuperate and get myself together. I don't want to put no strain on me. Absolutely. I mean, you've done so much. At this point, you should be able to sit back and relax and reap the benefits, you know, of what you know what you created. You put so much work into it. So, so no social media websites or nothing that we can share? No. Okay, got you. No problem. Okay, <laughs> well, hey. That's gonna, that, all that's going to do is make a mess. So <laughs> I, I just leave it alone. <laughs> okay, no problem. Well, again, I want to thank you for allowing me to interview you on Vinyl Esquire. Vinyl Esquire is the DJ podcast that uplifts the DJ culture and honors our legends. My name is DJ Rip, and you now and I have had the pleasure of listening to the legendary DJ Disco B. Thank you. Thank you all all. I hope I come see you. I hope I see y'all again. Hello, world. I want to welcome you to Vinyl Esquire, the podcast that delivers culture, truth, music. You should have talk me to dick in a half a doctor. Come on, Grandmaster. Let's rock. Say what? Uh-huh. Two. Check one, two, one. Oh yeah, you're now listening to the sounds of the man that they call Grandmaster Flash, easy mic, the disco B and I am the man that they call Melly Mel Rockwell. Grandmaster Flash behind the wheels and still got to be the real deal. Most hands in the sea got clams, most side the Coney Island got rides. Most class in Central Park got grass. Flash got rap of a time. You don't stop, you don't stop, stop that body rock, cause it's on. I like popcorn, then the beat don't stop till the break of dawn. I like a little boy through blowing on his horn. A Saturday night, a dance marathon. I like a grasshopper hopping on the morning lawn, and you know it got to be on. Grand Master Flash in the disco beat. Easy mic and I'm the MC. You walk in the place, you listen to the bass. See Mellon now with a smile on his face. The king on the song with another microphone. You should know by now, you'll never be alone. Now when I rap so deaf, so nice to dress. You should know by now, I don't set up a left. Cause I'm on, bad, cooling out. You say Mellon Mel's bad, without a doubt. I'm down for class to make a lot of cash. But say, come on, class, cause you cut so fast. You yeah, don't keep. stop. Yeah, yeah, don't stop that body rock Because the beat is going to be the sure shot Now you say everybody's here today at the celebrity club Now if you want to get down If you if you want to get down to the funky sound Somebody say ho, ho oh, Let's get, get it see. on Let's get it on Come on, get on the floor Freaking some more Get what you paid that money for